Well, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, glad to see you all here. We're doing a presentation on how to contribute to OpenStack. It's for newbies, and we're trying to keep it lighthearted. So feel free to laugh, join in. Uh, see If you see anything you recognize, go for it. <laughs> uh, so we actually work with AT&T. We're on the uh, integrated cloud. And uh, we work on the OpenStack community team. Uh, we are doing a little bit of uh, upstreaming for a, a test suite called Patrol. And we're also doing a little bit of work on um, uh, oh, yeah, we actually do a little bit of work on the security side of things now, and so we're looking at different things like Barbican, Keystone, and other projects um, within OpenSec. So a little introduction. Um, hi, everyone. So my name is Jae-woo. Um, so a little bit of a background on um, my OpenStack journey. I started programming um, and research in academia, uh, specifically in medical research. And then um, that kind of led into a lot of application development opportunities. So that transitioned me into uh, an applications developer role uh, within AT&T. And then I kind of came across this black box called the cloud and was really curious about um, how the, the cloud really worked. So transitioned over into a cloud infrastructure team at AT&T. And probably wondering, fun fact, um, I study self-driving cars on my free time, so I do a lot of stuff about deep learning and sensor fusion. Uh, so my name is Nicholas Helgeson, and I actually have a degree in plant virology, which is a little strange, I know. Uh, but I actually discovered programming because I went into the field and I didn't really like it very much. So I actually discovered a program called Udacity. Some of you may know it. Uh, through them, I did a full stack nano degree and got an internship with AT&T last summer. That's actually where I met Jaywoo. And uh, ever since then, I go, well, I got switched to a full-time role with them. And ever since, I was working with uh, AT&T on OpenStack. And before I ever did that, I had no idea what OpenStack was. Uh, so another kind of interesting thing from my perspective is that I found it very interesting, the um, similarities between how viruses interact with the body and interact with plants, and the similarities between that and the way code interacts with things like servers and viruses and code and things like that. Uh, so a little bit of our background. We are web app developers. That's where we came from. Uh, he was more in the full stack or front end. I was more in the full stack back end stuff. Uh, we know things like Python and frameworks like Flask and Angular and things like that. So when it came to OpenStack, when it came to open source, we had very little experience. OpenStack was a black box. It was magic to us. We just, the little we did know about it was, you know, you kind of throw your app at it and it makes it uh, elastic. It makes it load balanced and just takes off from there. So um, now that you know a little bit about our background, um, we think you would benefit from this presentation if you're, um, you have development experience somewhere else and you're transitioning over into OpenStack, or if you're a new developer just starting your journey out um, and then you happen to just come across OpenStack um, out of luck, or you're managing a team and um, you want your developers to contribute more and be active in the open source community, uh, OpenStack community, sorry. So, a little bit of an agenda. So um, we'll kind of address the problems that we faced when we were um, starting out with OpenStack and the method that we kind of took and uh, think that really worked out well and um, think that can work out for everyone else that's starting uh, to learn OpenStack. And then we'll be doing a very brief introduction into DevStack. Um, you guys probably already have experience with DevStack, but um, since it's an EV guide, we thought it was uh, necessary to kind of do a little bit of an introduction. And then uh, we'll be talking about Tempest, which is the most uh, main point, the testing suite of OpenStack um, that we'll be talking about. And then we'll do a slight demo on using Tempest and PDB and what you can kind of learn from there. So in the end, you'll have a better understanding of how OpenStack works in general. So um, going back to our background, um, when we transitioned over to, into cloud, cloud, uh, cloud infrastructure development, we're actually very thrilled uh, at the opportunity because um, we finally got the chance to learn about the black box that we had no idea um, how it worked, right? So um, we started learning about OpenStack in general before we dived into a specific project like other people um, um, kind of suggested that, that we do. And we kind of came across a, a couple of problems. So 
why do we have a problem um, when we're first starting out learning OpenStack? It was, you can kind of relate it back to um, the fact that we were very coupled to using frameworks and libraries that was a development toolkit. So we're very used to using these frameworks and libraries that were meant to be used to develop applications, and it was very uh, unlike OpenStack. So these um, development toolkits had a very low area, barriers to entry, and the user base was doubtably larger and more diverse, and had a plethora of tutorials, training material, and step-by-step -step guidelines. And it was easier um, to make a sandbox setting and play around with a couple of prototypes before you could push it up into a production environment. OpenStack was a little bit different. Um, the documentation and the community was, uh, is fantastic. However, um, it's not as obvious as these development tools that we were familiar with. Um, so not all the challenges, the errors, have been replicated on Stack Overflow, and you just can't go and copy and paste and pray that things work out. So it's a very challenging environment for newbies. And when we were starting out, we started out with the low-hanging fruit, like other people suggested, and this was a common advice given by our coworkers and other people in the community as well. However, um, when we looked through Launchpad, it was a little bit difficult to find a chewable bug because um, the, the easier ones uh, would get picked up easily because there is a lot of open source contributors trying to um, um, become, I guess, major contributors. And it was hard to explore different projects to find something that we could actually work on. So it was confusing, but eventually we found something and, and submitted a patch for that. Um, although we had to go through the troubles of setting up DevStack under a company proxy that we had. Um, but hooray, now we're officially OpenStack contributors, right? So looking back, what did we learn from that um, bug fixing experience, that low-hanging bug fix experience? Um, it taught us a lot about the Garrett workflow. workflow. Um, it taught us a lot about how the code review process is. It taught us, it gave us a refresher on several Git commands that we've never used before in the past, frankly. And um, we, it also taught us how to interact with the community and how to do code reviews and things like that. Um, but we still had a fundamental problem that wasn't really solved. Um, so what was that problem? Where do you go from there? Um, what's next after fixing that first low-hanging bug, right? So where do you go from there? Um, more bug fixes. You go, you go on Stack Overflow, or excuse me, you go on uh, Launchpad, and you find all these bugs. You find a bug like Nochi upgrade from Newton to Okada fails. Well, when I first started, I had no idea what any of those mean. And frankly, I still don't know how to fix this bug. I don't even know where to start on that. Um, so read the docs. You know, who wants to read the docs? Have you seen the documentation? Has anyone actually taken a look at all the different levels there are? No way. Uh, unit testing. So there was another common low area that people would suggest to go ahead and start with. But we ran into the same problem. So we said, you know, well, which project do I start on? Uh, where do I start on unit tests? You know, what do I test? So we had problems. And um, like Jay was saying, you know, I did my first bug. It was a low-hanging fruit. It was a one-line change. What did I learn? I didn't really discover anything about that service. I didn't know what it was doing. Frankly, the one-line change was pretty cool because I was an open SAC contributor, but that was about it. Um, I mean, we were web developers. We weren't in for rock stars, and we just hope that our way is going to help you where we didn't have any help. So we're not saying the documentation is bad, right? It's wonderful. If you know what you're looking for, uh, it's very specific in that sense. You can go in and learn uh, what you need to and get out. However, if you're starting new, you can kind of get lost. It feels like a rabbit hole, because um, every link leads to another, and you go from one page to a wiki, and back to one page, and then a wiki. You kind of get the idea, right? Um, so you can get lost if you're just starting out. So what is a less of a didactic approach? So we very much agree that starting with unit test is a good idea. However, as Nicholas mentioned, it's really hard to find out where to start. Um, so we think you should get a general understanding of OpenStack first before you dive into a specific project, then start getting to know that project by looking at unit tests. So we'll be learning at how different components work by looking at tests in Tempest, uh, which I'll explain later on, um, and dig deeper down into the API tests and scenario tests in specific that Tempest offers. 
So um, since this is a newbie session, we'll now go into a little bit of an introduction to DevStack. If you already know, please sped through it. <laughs> so um, like we said, newbie guide. Uh, so we figured it was a good time to start right at the beginning. How to get into DevStack up and running, Ubuntu, that kind of thing. So there are lots and lots of resources online on how to do this. They're very, very good. So I'm just going to go through it really quickly. Obviously, you're going to start with a virtual machine. Uh, we picked Ubuntu. It's uh, just what we liked. Uh, we. <laughs> Well, because that's what everybody on our team was doing. Okay, so there's a really, there's a really important reason you start with a virtual machine as opposed to your developer desktop. When you run DevStack, it, it's going to assume that you're running a virtual machine. Yeah. Uh, and so that's the reason that you would start with a And that's, that's an excellent point, thank you. No problem. <laughs> um, and f to that point, I've, I've made maybe 20 different virtual machines and broken every one of them. Uh, I have one running right now, which is good. Hopefully it doesn't break. <laughs> and you guys will see that one uh, very soon. Um, so you would want to go to GitHub, find DevStack, clone it, set up the local config file. This was a particular pain point for us because working in AT&T, we were working behind proxies. Um, this was a lot of work to set up and actually get things stacked. Uh, so here's an example of said local.conf file. Uh, this one's very, very simple. It's what you get when you copy over uh, the sample file that exists uh, on DevStack um, with a few things redacted. And um, so the reason this is important is because this allows you to designate what branches of what services you're going to use in your DevStack. So from here, let's do a little example just to see what DevStack looks like. Uh, so right now I have um, Ubuntu running. And the first time it stacks, you get something that looks like this. So you have your uh, IP address of um, your locally running um, Horizon, uh, your login name and passwords, which are set up in your um, uh, comp file. And then uh, if you type screen-r, you're rejoining the uh, processes that are running in the background. So you have access to a um, text-based um, access. So you can do something like open stack user list, and you get a list of users. Uh, if this doesn't work for you off the bat, then what you need to do is you need to source an open RC file and add admin at the end. That gives you admin rights. Uh, another way of accessing this kind of uh, data is you log in. This is the Tempest, or um, excuse me, um, Horizon. <laughs> and this is the Horizon GUI, thank you. <laughs> and you can log in with your login name and password. And you get the same information here. So that's a, just a quick look at DevStack running. So here's just a quick overview of what I just showed you. Uh, so screen R, which is apparently being depreciated or deprecated. And uh, so once you're in screen, there's an important code. Uh, control shift A gives you a list of all the running uh, processes, but obviously that's not important anymore. So Tempest is our main focus for today, as I talked about in the agenda, right? So what exactly is Tempest? It's an integration test suite to be run against a live OpenStack cluster. 
whether it be a one node dev stack that we talked about or a thousand node cloud. So um, it strives to cover all of OpenStack. Um, so it has, as I said before, uh, API tests and um, scenario tests, among other things. Um, and API tests cover um, validating the APIs that, that services in OpenStack use to communicate with each, with each other. And the scenario tests cover common scenarios that um, demonstrate a working cloud. And so why exactly is Tempest an entry, uh, appealing point of entry to new developers? It holds a lot of valuable information about OpenStack in general, and that's why we think it's a very valuable entry point. Um, you can, for the API test, you can view specific APIs and compare that with the documentation so that you get a better understanding of the requests and responses of that specific API, which would generally give you a better understanding of that service and OpenStack in general. And um, if you look at scenario tests, you can view common scenarios that happen in OpenStack um, and um, kind of educate yourself about what an operator might go through uh, when they're dealing with OpenStack. So by looking at Tempest, you're learning more about the API and common scenarios that happen in OpenStack. And you can kind of get a better sense of how different services work um, independently and kind of see how they interact together by looking at the scenarios. Does this sound like a general um, good overview of OpenStack? Um, Adam agrees, I guess. <laughs> cool. So how do you access the tests in general in Tempest? Um, there, among many ways, um, you, can ac you can look at the directory as Tempest itself, but that is a problem in itself because Tempest allows plugins, so it won't let you discover all the tests available. So another method is you can use test the test R engine and uh, perform a list tests, and Nicholas will be showing that in a little bit. And you can run a specific test by using test R run and calling that specific test. So running the Tempest tests, there's various ways of running them. Um, so the primary method of running all the Tempest tests is by using Tempest run. Um, however, um, we think that using Python test tools is the best educated way of doing things. And Nicholas will explain why. Uh, so the first things first, um, test R is not compatible with PDB. So we're going to be using PDB in our tests to try and uh, dig deeper into them. Um, so if you try to add a PDB break and run it with test R, you're gonna get this error. So you have to use the Python test tools. So for those of you who aren't familiar with PDB, here are some general keys, codes that we're going to use, commands that we're going to use to walk through the code. So basically, we're just gonna be able to look at the code that's around us, step through that code, and uh, finish it if we're done with it. So now we have the tools that we need, so we're gonna go deeper into the code. <laughs> uh, so what PDB helps us find is, basically, it gives us an opportunity to look past the functions that we see in the, just looking at the code, just looking at the test. We're able to see the code that it's firing. It's going to lead us all the way down the chain to the point where it's going to make an API call. And it gives us better, a better understanding of the service and what that service is doing and how we can go further and, and, and test that. So I'm gonna go through an example of that. So if um, you have any questions, go ahead and stop me um, while I'm doing it. And then I can show you from there. So we're gonna go back to my virtual machine where I am running. Uh, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at the code. So um, the, what I'm gonna show you here is, um, <laughs> so this is actually, this is Patrol. So this is a, a Tempest plugin and it runs RBAC testing on uh, Tempest. So what I've done here is I've added an import for PDB and then I'm just gonna do something simple like create user and I've added a set trace here um, so that uh, this is where the code is gonna stop. So once you now go to the terminal, run the code. So we're gonna be running the code out of um, the OpStack Tempest folder. So that's where every, all the code is being run from. So the first thing we need to do is uh, list the tests in order to find them. So we're gonna do a test R, list tests. So this is gonna give us a very long list. Um, I forgot to grep it. So the thing we're gonna have to do next is grep for the uh, users. 
So test star. I'm just going to use my. Uh, uh, this is a shortcut that I set myself. So um, here we have test create user. So we're going to do uh, the um, Python dash m test tools. Run and then we're going to run that one. Uh, so here we can see that PDB has stopped us. So we're going to take a look at where we're stopped and we can see that we're stopped exactly where I put my set trace. So we're going to step through the code a little bit and step into uh, where it's going to create the user so that we can see where it's doing. Yes? That's a good sandy check. check. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we're stepping through the code. We found a um, place where it's been, uh, it's being called. So we're going to step through that too. So we can take a look at it, and we see that it's being called right here in uh, the user's client. So that's where we're going to try to get to. And then see right here, we've switched from the patrol folder to the Tempest folder. So now we're running directly from Tempest and we're running directly from the user's client. So if we take a look at that, we can see that this is where it's being called from. And if you didn't know about this, then it's a very enlightening fact that we now understand where the API is being called from. And now we can go through the code and find that API and change it there. Another thing that this does is it allows us to write more tests because we understand how the test is set up. We understand where the, where the code is coming from. Uh, another really cool thing about PDB, if you're unfamiliar with it, is that I can now do a print statement for something like uh, the response from the server. And we can get more information that way. And that really helps us later when we're trying to debug the code. So from here, what do we do? We want to find a way to contribute. So we now understand more about what's going on behind the scenes. But where does that really help us? Where does that leave us? So there are lots and lots and lots of tests that are necessary to keep OpenStack running smoothly. And not all of the APIs are tested. Some of the tests are passed with errors in them as much as we try to avoid that. Um, and other tests are just testing the wrong thing. I actually almost posted one test that was testing the completely wrong thing, but it was still passing the test. Um, so mistakes happen, and what you can do is you can go through that code and find where these tests are missing and contribute your own code. And what that, is, what that really does for us is um, it removes us from the necessity of other people finding bugs. It removes us from the necessity of other people telling us what tests need to be done. And it really gives you the freedom to write your own tests, to contribute on your own time in your own way. <clears throat> so I was going to do one, more, one last example for you guys um, on how you can write, find and write your own tests. So uh, from here, we're going to go to the Tempest folder. And one of the things that I discovered recently was that in, um, so running on the Tempest uh, server itself, uh, this is the same area that's being tested by Patrol, which is the test that I was just showing you. And uh, this is the ver V3, version 3, um, identity test. And as you can see here, this is the, for the users. Uh, there is no actual test for create user. Um, so this could be an oversight. It could be intentional. Uh, the best way of knowing is to submit a bug. Uh, so you can ask the community or you can go on the IRC platform, ask if, there is a, if this was intentional or not. So one of the thing, another way you can check is on v2, there is a test for test create user. 
Uh, so this is great for us because that means that there's already a template for a create user, and it's really easy to just go ahead and copy paste that into v3 tests. Now you're going to have to make some edits because obviously v3 is not v2. Um, so I did that for you already here. Uh, so basically I just went through and made sure that it was using the v3 client instead of v2, uh, put in a few parameters. And the cool part about it that here is that if we go back to the Tempest and list the tests again, we'll find it there. Test R list tests. So here we have the t uh, that's patrol. V3 test users, test create user. So we can just run a Tempest test on that. And we can see that it will run. So, Sounds very cool, but I guess it works. <laughs> cool. So uh, our method's not really perfect. Um, you can see a lot of flaws, as so in our presentation too. Um, but um, you'll learn a thing or two uh, if you if you start looking into Tempest and really looking at the different tests that a specific service has. Um, if you look at just create users, as Nicholas talked about, there's a lot more to it than just uh, a bunch of assert equals. So you, you'll learn a lot about um, Keystone, if, if you will, uh, if you look at the Keystone tests, um, or whatever service you choose. Um, so this wasn't really a step-by-step -step guideline, uh, although we kind of wanted to do, do it in that, that terms, um, because we're kind of limited by the 40-minute time frame, right? But uh, we really think if you look at Tempest and kind of teach yourself OpenStack that way, it can be a step-by-step -step guideline. Um, and you do have to remember when you're looking at one specific service uh, project <laughs> service in Tempest, um, because every component in OpenStack is set up slightly differently, so um, there might be some discrepancies there. But that's the case of uh, open source software, and you kind of have to live with that, with knowing that fact. So that's what they meant when they said start by looking at unit tests, and that's. A soft wrap for our presentation. Do you guys have any questions for us? That's the VM, yeah. Or, uh, oh, with the test R? Okay. No, I see. And you can step into the telemetry connection. And often what I'll end up doing, and this is really nice if you like talking to a live server. When you talk to like a keystone server running behind a patch, yeah, yeah. Uh, do debug mode or whatever it is, um, it allows you to do a remote connection to it or a local bus telemetry connection to it. And, um, and so there's just a few caveats. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Thank you. Um, you. You talk about trying to figure out what to work on or test. Another way you can scale in, I think uh, Gage is a great example of this. There's a weekly meeting Gage? for whatever project that you're in. Go to those weekly meetings on IRC. Mm -hmm. And if you find out what developers are actually working on, and if you say, hey, I'll work on the Tempest test for this feature that you're working on there, you will get such a degree of support that you can do it with. Because that's the last thing that the person who sits down in Nova Code is, is thinking about. You say, well, you're going to have, I'll work on the car quality test for that. Now you're working on features that are mm -hmm. kind of underdeveloped, what people actually care about. You'll have to go in, you review their code as well to see the changes that they're doing. But by writing a, 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 a temp, Tempest test, a bombshell test for that, you'll get it. Mm -hmm. that, Thank you. Does anyone else have a little bit more simple questions on our process? <laughs> well, today I learned developers actually talk to people. <laughs> Kidding. Uh, but I, um, to expand on Adam's point, I actually did look at um, our PDB when I was actually working on Keystone, because you can't really um, do a PDB set trace on an Apache server. So, um, but I had some trouble setting up, so I, I think that's why I kind of put that notion aside. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, another thing is that uh, open source is just the nature of it. Everything's different. And what works for Keystone doesn't necessarily work for uh, Nova. And uh, it's just a matter of exploring use BDB, and that's kind of what we're trying to convey for you guys. Yeah. Does anyone have, um, going back to the questions, does anyone have uh, simpler questions for us? <laughs> Um, we are going, we are actually on the security team, so uh, we'll be looking at security related matters. Um, but yeah, that's our next journey. Yeah, so we're still in the process of upstreaming, upgrading uh, a few things for at and Well, okay. So well, before we finish off, uh, we would like to mention that at and is proud to be a member of the LCO community. Um, I see the two guys cringing back there <laughs> and taking a picture. Um, but on behalf of everyone working on OpenStack, um, as well as us, we'd like um, to thank you guys for coming um, out and spending time with us today uh, here on this presentation. And we try to muster together um, the common pain points that a new developer onboarding OpenStack kind of com would come across and kind of our opinions on how that can be improved. Um, we hope that a lot of new developers can benefit from this. and. Um, kind of improve upon the process of this new onboarding procedure as things change in OpenStack, which is pretty fast. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you.